Thank you so much. This is Rachel Mertens Meyer. I'm the CEO and founder of Rivia Health. And at Rivia Health, we've learned that on average, it takes 60 to 90 days for healthcare providers to get paid. And so that we've also learned through our research that a primary reason for the delay in patient payment is really the fact that it's very inconvenient for patients to get visibility to understand and pay their medical bills. So what uh, we have done is we apply um, modern mobile first digital consumer centric payment technology to patient payments. And we address the fact that the number one reason patients don't pay their medical bills is that they actually didn't know about the bill or they lost track of the bill. And so what we do is we send text, email, and push notification reminders to patients, and we give them a very easy to pay online portal, as well as a mobile app for patients who have many bills across multiple providers. And we enable them to easily manage their bills. As a result, we get our customers, the healthcare provider organizations, paid within five days on average. And in fact, 45% of patients pay on day one with the Rivia Health platform. So as you can see, I'm on my way to a customer meeting. Those results are translating into sales. We're growing our business. And, and I really look forward to speaking with you. Thank you again for your patience with me calling from the car. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, and with that, um, we'll lean it over to the pa investor panel. Um, we have Joanne McMaster, Fletcher McCusker, James Golka, and Ariane Tom, as well as Karen Ivancha, um, moderating the panel. Um, if you have any questions uh, for Rachel and Rivia Health, uh, please uh, please ask it now. Rachel, hi, uh, Fletcher here in Tucson. Can you briefly say how you accelerate uh, payment, it seems like a very complicated process. It'd probably take you a long time to explain that, but briefly, just how does it work? Sure, no problem. Um, so one of the key ingredients is creating communication that is both convenient and visible, accessible, and also uh, frequent. So We've developed an automated communication engagement platform that sends text, email, and push notifications with actionable items um, and insights for patients about their medical bills. So like I said, actually the number one reason patients don't pay bills when they can afford to is that they lost track of the bill or they were never aware of the bill in the first place. So by sending mobile first uh, communication and making sure that patients are getting visibility to their bills on their mobile phone where they're looking 96 times a day, we're helping there. Another key ingredient is making sure that it's easy for patients to take action on those bills uh, once they get visibility to them. So we've developed um, our systems with our mobile app as well as a quick pay online portal for one-time payments. That is a three-step bill pay process um, and it does not require a password. It does not require an account ID. So it becomes a much more seamless process where you can pay your medical bill right in a grocery line, for example. Um, and we do also make payment plans available and easily understandable through our platform as well. So that's helping address those patients that may not be able to pay the full bill right away, but they can pay in increments if they're aware that that's an option. Great answer. And are you collecting a fee? Do you get a commission? Is that how you get paid? Yes, we, um, sorry. Yes, we actually have a transaction based model. So we charge a 1% fee for all charges that go through our platform. And it, it ranges between 1% and 2%. Great. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Travis Witzke with Desert Valley Tech, and we are storing blood to save lives. As a soldier early in the Iraq war, I provided aid to and was un unfortunately unable to save a wounded civilian from bleeding out. 
if I had whole blood to transfuse rather than saline, uh, we would have had a much better opportunity to save his life. So inspired by that experience to fill the point of injury care gap with whole blood, we uh, created the Hemoporter and LifeDoc platform, a cold storage and transport uh, device to uh, cool and transport biomaterials like blood and blood component therapies, vaccines, pharmaceuticals, human organs, and more. We couple end user innovation. So uh, my experience is on the ground with novel desi uh, designs combining active and passive cooling to double the currently fielded products called storage performance. Our smart containers have sensors to provide payload storage conditions required for inventory managers to send their inventory outside of a hospital farther than ever before. The life dock provides cooling efficiency with a large refrigeration unit, while the hemoporter canister undocks, allowing for lightweight portability while transporting your cold store products for five days or longer. Recently, we picked up a National Science Foundation, SBIR phase one, to expand from our single canister design to see right here, um, to a modular blood bank platform. So it can scale to the mission at hand, whether you are serving a population of 10 or a population of 20,000. Uh, kind of think medical cold storage in Lego format. Uh, we had designs uh, that we're working on for airdrop pallets, as well as shipping containers and utilizing our quad cube design for trucks and helicopters, in addition to uh, UAV and backpack carry for the individual can designs. I'm joined with Desert Angels. First, uh, thank you for your service. My son is a flight medic, so I can appreciate the um, problem that you're trying to solve. Can you talk a little bit about the IP in terms of the weight and uh, the storage capacity? Uh, storage capacity for the individual cans right now is just over one liter. Uh, our beachhead market is carrying whole blood. So we designed the can just to fit two 500 ml bags of blood, uh, which through the research of Iraq and Afghanistan wars have shown they haven't used more than two bags on any surviving casualty uh, over the course of 20 years. So we limit our designs to cut weight. Uh, the, I'm sorry, what was the first party question? The weight of the, so the portable unit, um, the weight of that. So the individual cans uh, are right about eight pounds. So we're still playing with different uh, interior thermal solutions to hold that cold storage capacity. So that might get us just under eight or just over, depending on what we ultimately settle on. Uh, the docking station itself, the quad design that you see right here, uh, it is relatively lightweight. It's about eight pounds itself. So if you have four cans plus the docking station, that is still very man portable uh, to drop it on a truck or mount it in a helicopter. Thank you. I'd like, this is uh, Jim from uh, ATI. I'd like to ask three questions. The, the most important is tell us about your IP. Mm -hmm. The second two questions relate to the product itself. And that is uh, one, if a canister is open, can it be resealed and uh, 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 retain storage uh, capability and see what is the power source for keeping cold, the, the larger units cold. Thanks, Jim. Uh, the IP. So what makes us unique is most products on the market are either active cooling like a refrigerator or passive cooling like a um, igloo cooler, if you will, like gel plates or, or something like that. Uh, so our IP is focused on the functionality of uh, combining the two and having the undockable canister uh, for portability use. Um, which going into the open and reseal portion, yes, they can be resealed. So depending on whatever the clinician is putting inside of that canister, ultimately that'll dictate um, whether they can functionally use it once exposure has occurred. Um, I know particular to whole blood, it can be exposed to um, outside conditions for up to 30 minutes and still be functional um, by cooling it back down. Um, anything beyond that, you've got to use it within a 24 hour period. Um, but an, a, a nice part of this too is having the sensors inside. If you don't open the canister, if you never use the whole blood or vaccines, you can send it right back and redock it into the cooling tower and cool it back down. So we have the opportunity to essentially create an indefinite cooling period as long as you're close enough to redock it uh, before it heats up, before your uh, heat performance thresholds. Uh, power sources right now, we're just using a, a standard 110 plug for our prototypes. Uh, but we are exploring uh, solar panel operated designs and battery mounting inside of the uh, docking station so that we can utilize uh, kind of a trickle charge method for extremely remote locations. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Hey, Travis, uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, this is Kiran Avancha with Donor. Uh, I have a, one question. Uh, have you had any conversations with the DOD or military from a customer standpoint of you? Uh, yes, we have. So we just talked with, uh, I'm going to drop his name, so I forgot, um, the colonel in charge of the Armed Forces Blood Bank. Uh, it's an Air Force colonel. Um, my apologies for getting. But uh, his feedback directly related to the design that you see on this side uh, with the large format uh, drawer coming out of the bottom of the units there. Uh, he said their largest issue is moving vast amounts of blood or other biomaterials into a combat theater or humanitarian area. Uh, so they need the ability to move in mass and then break down to individual cans for um, modular carry. Uh, so we decided to scale up and provide a, uh, a larger format container so that we can hold 100 to 150 units of whole blood, uh, particular to our beachhead market, so that it can be broken down at a later point. And I will say moving all of that inventory into an area uh, is reduced because we have the ability to rapidly cool uh, your biomaterials down. So you can collect blood from your patient population in that area and store it on site, reducing the need to fly everything in. Thanks, Travis. Thank you. Good morning. My name is John Valour. I'm CEO and president of Illumin Scientific. And uh, we, our focus is advancing vision restoration for those over the age of 50. The leading cause of blindness in those over the age of 50 is dry, age-related macular degeneration. It's a progressive disease that affects the central field of vision. In fact, one in four people become symptomatic with the disease by age 60. Our surface neurostimulation uses energy to improve the central field of vision and slow the progression of geographic atrophy. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, no treatments exist for dry MD. Globally, 93 million are untreated, and in the U.S. alone, it's 11 million. With only a 10% market penetration, this opportunity represents a $3 billion market just in the U.S. alone. Now, our low-level neurostimulation activates specific cells within the retina. The five-day treatment regimen results in more than 53% of those treated to experience a three-line improvement in visual acuity with just in five days of treatment. Our focus is simple, use energy to repair and regenerate the neural cells. By activating the neural cells, we help improve uh, in vision and slow the progression of geographic atrophy. Our plan is to exit via acquisition before commercialization. We've already initiated discussions with strategic targets such as Elcon and J&J. &J. We recognize that acquisitions within ophthalmology have all been pre-revenue with valuations over 300. Our investment rationale is strong. Three-line improvement in visual acuity within five days, a 40-month uh, pathway to commercialization, and ophthalmic companies are already interested in our technology. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. John, have you done any human trials? you have any human data? We did. We conducted a, a patient study uh, with 270 patients and treated over 539 eyes. Hence, that's how we know that we saw an improvement of uh, 15 letters or three lines or more among 53% of the patients that were treated. What's the next step then in the testing? Sure. The next step is a uh, safety study for FDA clearance, followed by a efficacy or pivotal study uh, so that we can secure FDA clearance as a uh, under the de novo process, which will take us roughly 36 months. Uh, just to suggest and reach out to the Foundation for the Blind, if you have not, they fund a lot of research non-dilutive in your space. Thank you. We will definitely do that, Fletcher. Good luck. Thank you. Hey, John, this is Karen from Honor Health. Um, Quick question on uh, your uh, clinical trial that you're planning on conducting. Um, yes. You, you said you, you need the money of 1.5 for conducting a clinical trial? That is correct. And, and do you think it would be sufficient to get to a, a safety and efficacy stage? Uh, 
Uh, that will not get us to the efficacy stage. That will get us through the uh, first portion uh, of the uh, safety stage. Uh, we do have a warrant offering that's tied to this, uh, which would raise the additional capital to close out the uh, uh, safety stage. Thank you. Uh, and this is Jim again at, at ATI. Uh, what IP do you have? Uh, our IP is uh, we currently have uh, six U.S. patents that have been granted. Those are around the way in which the stimulation is delivered to the treatment area, the electro design and so forth, as well as the concept of using home-based treatment and monitoring so that uh, patients would not be required to come into the office for the office-based uh, treatment regimen. Uh, in addition, we have patents in the EU, uh, Australia, and Canada, as well as uh, we just were granted in Japan within the last month. Terrific. Thank you. Got to ask this. Does it hurt? It does not. Essentially, uh, the feeling that uh, patients experience while being treated is that they see phosphenes. If you were to close your eyes and rub your uh, eyelids very intensely, you would see small lights that would appear. That's an activation of the uh, neural cells within the uh, retina that's causing that. That's essentially the, the feeling that the patients experience uh, during the treatment regimen. Okay, thank you. John, Steve Wynn also suffers from this disease and has funded a lot of uh, research. I did not realize that about Steve. I, I will uh, see if uh, his uh, family office is uh, still investing. Thank you for the heads up on that, Flesh. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning. My name is Mario Blanco and I'm the CEO of Nanopec. Uh, today, I'd love to tell you about our uh, DNA automation platforms to protect, heal, and rejuvenate the human body. But first, I need to tell you about the problem in synthetic biology. This is uh, synthetic genes. The problem is that you need between 10 to 10,000 pieces of DNA to assemble a single working gene. For example, for the spike protein in COVID-19, you think you need about 10 pieces and this, each of these pieces need to, needs to be uh, made perfectly and there are errors in the manufacturing using uh, automated uh, processes. So what we need to do is uh, be able to do more efficient manufacturing. So we have patented nanoporoceramic chips. You can see a picture on, on the background. Uh, these are ceramic chips that are able to hold up to a million different pieces of DNA on a single chip depends upon the size, of course. So uh, our, our platform uh, competes uh, very well with existing technology from 1934 in that we can produce not just uh, many more pieces, but also the yields with emerging technologies are much larger. For example, our customers uh, remark the, uh, that they can obtain up to 70 times more DNA uh, on, a, on the same uh, size of a silicon chip. So it, this is driving the interest from, from our customers, the fact that we produce the same quality of DNA pieces, but we also yield about 70 times more because of our nanopore structure. Uh, the markets for our technology include uh, cell-free DNA vaccines and cancer therapeutics, uh, DNA banking, uh, very uh, fast growth area, and genomics and personalized medicine. Uh, so we um, also have studies that indicate, uh, published studies that indicate this area is growing at a CAGR of 22% all through 2027. Uh, in summary, the heavy lifting has been completed. We are technology ready, we are in beta manufacturing. Uh, we're expanding our laboratory right now. Our foundational patent has been granted, but we also have a pipeline of four pending patents. Uh, we have paying customers. Uh, we are launching our strategic sales this quarter and we have already established a distributor in Japan. We have a very experienced management uh, team, which includes uh, people with uh, experience in sales for over 10, 15 years. And this is my fourth uh, startup. So Nanopec makes DNA automation platforms to protect, heal, and rejuvenate uh, the human body. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mario. It's good to see you and a Thanks. nice presentation. Hey, can Thank you, you help me uh, understand a little bit more about the product and what you're selling today? So when I read the application, I saw Metapurex, Metaflorex, and the DNA, some part of which will be OEM. 
So can you kind of walk us through what you're actually uh, selling now and how those work together? Thank you. Sure, absolutely. So we perfected a method to generate these uh, ceramic films and, and they have about 12 different areas of application we have focused uh, lately on DNA. Uh, we actually uh, pivoted at the end of 2019 with two white papers in this area where we started trying out using our chips to make DNA. And it, it passed all the, uh, all the tests with uh, chemical tests with flying colors. And then we started in early 2020 to test our chips with uh, manufacturers of DNA around the world. One of our customers is the largest DNA manufacturer in the world. We have also reached out to US companies, but typically they are not the leading uh, early adapters. So we have to deal outside the United States as well because we believe that by going to early adapters, we are uh, pushing the limits of the technology. So by the time uh, other, other uh, manufacturers are ready, we will have uh, a leading edge uh, technology for them as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any FDA approval? No. Or? No, no, our material is never in, in contact with a human being. It's not a medical device. We will like to seek FDA certification. It's not necessary, but our um, part of our ask is to be able to get ISO 9001 certification and possibly FDA certification as well. Now, the material is very innocuous. It has been already used for brain implants uh, without any toxic effects on patients, but we are not in that field. It's just the same material um, is, is not non-toxic. And our pattern basically is to make this material using absolutely no heavy metals, no cytotoxic uh, elements. Thank you. Would you so this, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Kira. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Would you mind repeating uh, the, the revenue that you just uh, said, Mario? Um, that's a, did I hear it right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we are able to, we've been uh, working with some customers for a period of a year, uh, testing our materials, perfecting them for them, custom, customizing them. And in the process of, of, of doing this process, we ask questions like, what would eventually your orders be like? So they will tell us, you know, how tens of thousands of chips a day, and then from the estimate of how much they're willing to pay for them right now, um, and how much uh, the economy of scales might be able to save them in the future. We get uh, values between four to five hundred million dollars a year in four to five years. The reason is we need to ramp up production. Uh, there are about five studies that indicate that uh, synthetic biology in general is growing at this very fast twenty two percent a year. So we we put that into account in inside our estimates. So this is Jim at ATI. I I, I want to understand. Are you? selling a film that you could sell to people who make chips? Are you selling chips or are you going to license your technology to other chip makers? So, so we start with raw materials that we supply. We, we have our own suppliers uh, um, and then we produce the ceramic films and then we have uh, the ability to cut them and shape them in about 10 separate formats uh, all the way from pure films to laminated films with a metal core it depends on the properties that our customers seek. Some of them even require high optical purity. They also require embedded codes, like the one you can see on my back has an embedded DM code. Uh, those are, can be as small as one by one millimeter. So we have the technology to place uh, one by one millimeter codes with, with enough information on each chip so that they can be processed by our customers. We don't make DNA. We just make the manufacture, manufacturing of DNA uh, automated. So is, is there not an opportunity here to simply license the technology to chip makers and you could sell a lot, lot more people, uh, much larger volumes? I mean, you even think of you know, the chip makers that are, going, that are in, in Phoenix and going to be in Phoenix. Absolutely. We, uh, those are silicon chip makers, by the way. Mm -hmm. So we, we, our material is not silicon. Silicon chips um, are, are interesting and they have, this is probably a leading edge technology, but uh, it's very hard to activate the surface of silicon. So uh, we are able to beat the amount of DNA you can produce on the same size chip by a factor of 70. So that's not our data. This is our customer data. So they're, they're very interested because we produce uh, 70 times more DNA of high quality DNA on the same chip size when they compare to their silicon chips. So yeah, the less licensing model is not out of the question, but you know, I think uh, learning directly from customers is very high value for us. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Marvi Patel, the founder and CEO of Nixie, a women's health startup. As a high-risk pregnancy subspecialist, I'm used to having difficult discussions with women who find themselves facing unexpected complications in their pregnancy. Many of these women did not realize that they were at risk for a complication and would have gladly implemented preventative measures if they had early knowledge. In fact, a report from Blue Cross Blue Shield in 2020 documented a 30% increase in the rates of pregnancy and childbirth complications among their members in recent years. The problem is that the trend of increasing pregnancy-related complications leads to worsening downstream effects, such as preterm birth rates and newborns with health problems. Nixie has developed the Popnatal Maternal Health Platform which combines individualized prenatal care plans with telehealth maternity services to address the 30% rise in pregnancy complications. Popnatal uses proprietary digital health tools developed by clinicians to provide unique insights into a woman's pregnancy. Medical practices benefit from streamlined clinic efficiency and additional revenue generation, while payers benefit from improved clinical outcomes and cost savings. Additionally, our pipeline includes development of a companion blood test to pinpoint pregnancies at risk for very preterm birth, which, which accounts for over half of the pregnancy-related expenses borne by payers. To date, we've protected our IP, developed our platform, established strategic partnerships, and are preparing for a targeted market release. We welcome the opportunity to tell you more about our startup and our upcoming race. Thank you. Uh, yes, hi, I'll start. Uh, Joanne with uh, Desert Angels, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about uh, how this fits with uh, an existing uh, clinic practice. What kind of feedback have you gotten from clinicians uh, for using a, a, an additional tool like this? We've spoken to a variety of physicians and particularly with our target demographic being general OBGYNs, what they see is that the digital health reports um, provide insights that they may not have otherwise had uh, at the very beginning of pregnancy. We're targeting day zero to day one implementation. So preconception to a new OB visit. They feel that the reports provide support for counseling that they'd already be giving the patient. The problem is the patients don't always absorb all that information on the front end. So these become issues that sort of continue over time. Um, so we've gotten some, some good feedback that way in terms of uh, our technology supporting the existing care pathways. Hi, Avi. Uh, okay. okay. Do you license this? How, is it a subscription model? How do you scale it? Yeah, so right now, our, there, so we are open to, to working collaboratively with other medical practices to implement it, or locally in Arizona, we can actually set up a um, up our Nixie clinical element, which will actually work in conjunction with OBGYNs to implement this. The revenue comes from payers through, through existing ICD-10 codes. So um, a couple of different options depending on where we are geographically. Hello, um, thank you everyone for having me on today. So I wanna start by saying that script guard is personal to my heart because I lost two of my best high school friends to an opioid addiction. And I really knew I could no longer sit by while my friends were dying. Um, so there's three things you need to know about the opioid epidemic. First is that every 11 minutes, someone in the US dies from an opioid overdose. Second, 80% of heroin users started with a legal opioid prescription. And third, the FDA and the CDC have stated that the opioids are the golden standard for paid treatment. So this is where script guard becomes important. It helps physicians and patients and everyone comply with their opioid orders. So this is how script guard work. It's going to be filled by the pharmacist like any other prescription, except then script guard is locked by the pharmacist. This prevents the patient from having access to the entire pill supply at one time. Script guard then dispenses the medication at the time and in the amount prescribed by the physician. Um, we were able to do this with two pan pending timing systems that ensure the patient cannot take more of their opioid medication than they're supposed to. And then it permanently locks when the lifetime of the prescription expires. Then the device with any of its unused medication 
is returned to the pharmacy so any remaining medication doesn't sit in a medicine cabinet until it's stolen or misused. With ScriptGuard, a patient can take less of their opioid medication, but they can never take more. And this is where ScriptGuard needs your help um, to enter the marketplace and begin saving lives. We need investment um, to complete our final prototype and really introductions into the pharmacy, drug manufacturing, and insurance industries um, where we can begin serving our customers. Any questions? Brad, it looks like I could smack that open with my hammer. You know, how do you address, you know, the opiate addict who's not going to be patient enough to wait for that to spin around? Certainly. Um, and here's the thing. You can't, in the first version of this, you can smash it with a hammer. But the whole point of ScriptGuard is to prevent somebody from being addicted in the first place, not allowing them to build that dependency so they have the need to smash it with a hammer. We're on the front end of this, not the back end of this. Now, later versions, of course, we can have a copper wine that the engineers are working on that goes to cell phone chip, you can alert the physician and the um, prescribing uh, and the police that a possible overdose is in progress. Any customer interest? Have you shown it to anybody? Yeah, so we've done extensive market research and all the physicians we've talked to that prescribe opioids have been behind this. The simple fact that there's a big push that a lot of physicians have been negligent on the way they prescribe opioids. This is a step in the right direction to ensure that they are, you know, prescribing appropriately and they're taking the next steps. What will be the cost of it once it comes out? So we can manufacture these with scale for about less than $6, but where we really become advantageous is that these are reusable. They have to be mailed back in just to like the old um, kind of Netflix systems. It comes with that envelope. They put it in, they mail it back. But with scale, we can produce these very, very cost effectively. Thank you, Natalie. I appreciate your time and consideration today. As Natalie said, my name is Neela Trikara, CEO with Surpass Biologics, and we're working to restore healing through therapeutic innovation. And we're doing this by modulating active and damaging inflammation, bringing it back under control. Indeed, inflammation is necessary, and it is the immune system's normal reaction to protect the body from both infection and injury, actually. However, chronic and overstimulating and self-injuring inflammation is a main driver of disease. Further, it's quite debilitating, and our current standard of care exposes the lack of both available and appropriate therapeutic options. Our answer to this problem is an immune modulator. Think of this as uh, broadly as an anti-inflammatory, if you will, that targets autoreactive and damaging inflammation. In contrast to current standard of care, AKA throwing steroids at everything to work against the immune system, our protein therapeutics work with the immune system in a targeted and potent mode of action. Over 40 million patients experience debilitating inflammation, highlighting a very large patient profile that we can help. Our protein biologics competitive advantages will enhance healthcare providers with options of a highly potent and targeted anti-inflammatory. Our current goal is to raise seed funds to continue preclinical development in order to innovate medicine and rival standard of care in an exceedingly large market opportunity. We feel we're well positioned to be first in a new class of anti-inflammatory therapeutics. I uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Uh, and again, we are surpassed biologics, modulating active inflammation to catalyze and restore healing. Thank you for the, uh, the overview. Uh, Joanne McMaster with the Desert Angels. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are in preclinical development? Yes, we have a significant amount of background research. We are spinning out of the Arizona State University Biodesign Institute. And um, currently we have uh, three molecules. One which has a uh, parent molecule has actually been in the clinic before, which we modified it and have strong and new IP on. We're effectively gonna be starting our IND enabling studies uh, with this seed level round funding. So basically doing some pharmacology and toxicology studies, as well as, uh, as, well as solidifying our CMC and uh, getting our, our manufacturing and control manufacturing under, under wraps. And just to follow up on that, you said you're spinning out of, the, of ASU. Do you have a license for the technology? 
We have a license option agreement that is currently executed um, and it's exclusive uh, with the rights to um, complete the license agreement once we raise our funds. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Jim from ATI. I have two questions to ask. The first is, uh, do you have any business people that are involved with the business or is it, are you entirely uh, the ASU faculty members? Um, and the second question is, given that cytokine storms are a, a principal way of uh, killing young people in the military, have you talked with the Department of Defense and their research activities for grants from them? We have not uh, looked at the Department of Defense. Uh, very familiar with cytokine storms, uh, having been part of immunology training as, as my background uh, and, and executing uh, quite significant number of R&D initiatives in, in previous roles. Um, so business individuals, yes. Yeah. So we have a, quite an extensive team, uh, currently eight members, three that have very large pharma development experience, uh, both from the scientific bench perspective preclinical development perspective, as well as two senior uh, members of both Arizona and Southern California areas that have uh, extensive executive experience um, in, in this space. We are also working in the background with uh, another um, quite high profile individual uh, that we are seeking to um, bring on board and, and grow the team. So we actually have quite a good mix, I would say, between science, business, and uh, execution on the operation side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Iman Daryai, co-founder and CEO of Teresia Pharma. Immunotherapy is a promising and very effective cancer treatment strategy. The more estimated size for this market is over $258 billion by 2025. However, the biggest challenge in this market is that immunotherapy is not effective, is effective in only less than 20% of the total number of pa cancer patients. And currently uh, there is no clinical tool or method that helps oncologists to identify those non-responsive patients in less than two months. Teresia Pharma is developing a technology, a di clinical diagnostic product that helps oncologists to identify non-responsive patients by positron emission tomography or PET imaging uh, within two to three days after they start the therapy. This technology saved lives and it significantly reduced the cost associated with cancer treatment. Uh, the technology um, is externally validated by scientists and experts in the field and has received over $600,000 non-dilutive investment so far. With the experience and expertise of the Teresia team and the advantages that this technology is offering, we are able to tackle the challenges associated with cancer management. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and I'm willing to take any questions. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll ask. Hi, Iman. It's good Hello. to see you. Nice presentation. Hey, I'm just curious. Uh, you mentioned that you know the diagnostic agents save time and money. And do you have a sense of, of what what that means? Uh, you know how much time and and the efficacy as well. Yes, definitely. Uh, to answer that question, I first need to explain how it is going on in clinical um, setup right now. There are two methods uh, in clinical setup by uh, PET imaging and CT imaging. Both technologies allows physicians to have a sense whether immunotherapy is, not, is working or not. But the biggest problem for them is that they are not able to identify natural growth of tumor versus the effect that is coming from immunotherapy until two months after patients start immunotherapy. For immunotherapy, uh, the dose for the drug is very expensive. There are uh, $50,000 and sometimes more expensive than that. And a lot of patients are receiving several doses until they are diagnosed with the fact that they are non-responsive group for over 80% of the total number of patients. 
The other challenge here is that if physicians know whether a patient is responsive or not responsive to immunotherapy, they can switch to uh, alternative, more effective therapy, such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy, after they know that the ter immunotherapy is not working. And as we know, cancer can be a terminal disease for a lot of patients, even days is very, very important. So just imagine you know, waiting for one to two months until you know whether one particular therapy is working or not, is not an ideal setup for clinics. With our technology, we are able to identify the effective component of the fight from um, human body within days, within two to three days after patient start immunotherapy, we are able to say whether immune system is fighting against cancer or not. This is Jim at ATI. What, what IP do you have? Uh, the one IP is we have exclusive license from the University of Arizona where I invented the technology as one of the inventor. And we, are, we have filed, Teresia Pharma has filed two more IPs for the company itself. So, and is uh, not just the source, of, is it on process? Is it on chemistry? What, is the, what are the IP elements on? Uh, on both the chemistry and applications. The chemical process and application. Okay. And we want to accelerate our process for radio pharmaceutical industry. Unlike traditional pharmaceutical industry, things can be done in a faster pace. Even for FDA approval is not necessary for phase one clinical trials. So because of that fact, we would like to accelerate our process to get into human trials as soon as possible. We already formed a partnership with a leading biotechnology company that has a product in the market. But because of the advantages we are offering, they are interested to have their products uh, labeled with our technology or being under our technology for better uh, diagnosis, faster and more effective way. Um, I'm David Larwood, founder and CEO of Valley Fever Solutions. Over 600,000 people a year are at risk of death from increasingly drug-resistant fungal pathogens. Thousands die. Drug sales exceed 14 billion for the fungal diseases. Fungal dise diseases in our space cost over $3 billion in sales. Our antifungal Nicomycin Z, known by the short name Nick Z, not to be confused with Nick Z that you just heard about, has many advantages over both current drugs and drugs in development. One such drug was purchased by Pfizer in April of 2021 with only phase two data. Other large pharma companies have aging antifungal assets we think will be appealing to them. Nick Z is particularly effective against valley fever, more so than any known drug. Coxie in the brain requires therapy for life, which is bad news for hundreds more people every year thousands of people currently under, treat, under treat, treatment, which is very uh, challenging and inefficacious. A recent mouse disease study in the brain showed our, new, new, showed our new formulation eliminated all traces of infection in the brain or key organs in most of the subjects. 2,000 humans a year have severe disease, which will, will welcome a better solution. Briefly, Nixie is very specific to fungal proliferation, blocking a key structural component has very high safety, uh, fungicidal in many infections, nearly tasteless and well tolerated. One dog testing our new protocol thinks the dose is a snack and it makes him feel better, much better than five months of fluconazole. We're on track to test our new formulation by late 2022 in humans with phase two data about a year later. These should cost about 4 million and another 6 million. Uh, we look forward to talking to you. Leading drugs in our space sell for about 800 million. Our profile suggests we should reach 500 million and perhaps that $800 million level. Thank you for your time. Uh, Arizona dogs have a huge problem with valley fever. Have you done any work in the veterinary space? Uh, so vet, vet approvals are challenging because you have to go through almost all the work of the human. Uh, we're testing in dogs preclinical. Uh, there was a paper published in 2013 that showed good uh, results in uh, about nine dogs that were tested. Recent tests in three dogs, two of which are in Arizona, uh, showed that our formulation is as expected as shown in mice, is extremely effective. And uh, the dog disease is very representative of what humans uh, experience. So this shows very high promise for good success in humans. The uh, revenue model in veterinary use may be greater than the human model, uh, but it'd be interesting to see how you played that out. 
Yeah, we've looked at that. You know, the 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 classic thing for a rare disease, you can charge a hundred thousand dollars for uh, for rare disease. The current drugs cost uh, about that for you, well, at least thirty thousand per year. Unfortunately, the costs for dogs are are not dramatically cheaper. So yes, it's worth looking at. Uh, we've not come up with a model that's that's very promising yet. Well, we've managed uh, seven million dollars of NIH money. Uh, this is a, an asset that was developed by a company that went out of business. The key thing that we've done is our new formulation, which makes it work, uh, which everybody's, the, the industry, the fungal disease space has been waiting for this and the new formulation really is a breakthrough. So it's, a, it's are you going to go for a phase three or are you doing a phase three pivotal study? Um, what's the story on the uh, clinical development path, David? Phase one is done. Phase two is approved by the FDA with the new formulation. We'll have to do safety studies in PK and humans. So we'll probably do a one slash two in humans. We can be starting that in a year. Uh, then it'll take about a year to finish the phase two, maybe less. Right. Isn't it? This is. Uh, isn't this uh, classified as a rare disease? It is. So but then, we're using. Go ahead. No. Then I was just curious to know if you if you uh, had any negotiations with FDA in doing just one single pivotal study. Uh, so that would be my my. my question in terms of uh, trying to get an agreement with FDA on doing one single study. And the second thing is, uh, do you have any uh, chance to, uh, are you eligible for a priority review voucher? Ah, also good questions. Thank you for the, both of the suggestions. We have Orphan product designation as well as QIDP. Uh, priority, priority vouchers are um, useful basically for pediatric where we're not differentiated and uh, for tropical. Um, and it's, we're not well positioned for that. Uh, we would, you know, a voucher is probably tough. We certainly are thinking about it. Uh, in terms of approval path pathways, we're almost certainly qualified for breakthrough and get fairly rapid uh, uh, review. We've already, we had a meeting with the FDA, uh, it was a couple of years ago, just before COVID. Uh, and uh, they like the plan that we have and it's now an improved plan. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to jump right in. So I'm Joe Hunter from Vaccinum. We're focused on vaccines and therapeutics against global health challenges. And the problem we're looking to solve is the high prevalence of HPV in low middle income countries. And this is a big problem for two main reasons. A, these countries cannot afford the current HPV vaccines on the market. And B, 90% of HPV related deaths occur in these countries. So we have a solution which combines two different vaccine platforms, the first being a virus-like particle. So virus-like particles are used in the majority of vaccines on the market, including all current HPV vaccines. The second is a recombinant immune complex. This is based on human antibodies. So this gives us a customizable and robust vaccine platform. So we have four main competitive advantages. The first is we have the possibility of protecting against 22 or more strains of HPV, whereas Gardasil 9, the current best option, only protects against nine strains and is extremely expensive. Next, in preclinical studies, we've shown that we get immunity at two doses rather than three. Also, we have the potential for room temperature stability of our vaccine formulation, which would cut out much of the cold storage chain necessary for most vaccines. And lastly, we're doing our production in a plant-based expression system, which has been shown to just reduce manufacturing costs across the board. Now, our brief timeline is to finish preclinical trials by 2023, submit a IND application, which will hopefully get approved between 2024 and 2025, and then enter into phase one, two combined clinical trials in 2025 when that application is approved. Do you have current investors? What's the current status of the company? Currently, we are getting our IP through ASU. So we're an ASU spinoff. So we're in uh, a exclusive licensing agreement right now that's almost finalized. And then we are going to apply for some NIH applications and start raising funds. Is it the option agreement or are you going with a license agreement? License agreement. Great. Hi, 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Navik Rubensi, I'm founder of um, Yektasonix, we power non-invasive medicine. It's a focused ultrasound which is curing with sounds and it's a revolution in non-invasive and fast-growing medical therapy. It uses sound waves, for example, to treat cancer, removing cancer cells with no chemotherapy or surgery or modulating brain cells with and psychiatric conditions. There are over 150 medical conditions use this technology and this is four times increase in the past four years, which is amazing. There's a main part in this focus ultrasound medical devices, which is called phase array, which focuses the energy in the body and it's a sophisticated electronic system and it's very costly. And uh, they usually suffer from low performance of producing triastate pulses, which has problems for focus ultrasound devices, such as MRI corruption, heating and damaging transducer and electromagnetic radiation. Our solution is disruptive, highly cost uh, reduction uh, in these phase arrays, 10, 20 times more. For example, for 256 channel, we offer $10,000 versus $200,000. And we produce a pure sign of harmonic free output, which results as MRI compatibility and less heating and damaging transfers. And also our novel RF technology removes the requirement to have a matching network. It's a huge advantage when we talk to end customers. There is a good traction for technology among focused ultrasound medical devices. We started more, more than six years ago at University of California at Berkeley. And with many years of R&D, we achieved our core building block of four channel system. And we are the best. We have professor at the dictator at UC Berkeley in the team. I was the original inventor of technology at UC Berkeley. And we have, we built our uh, low channel count prototype. We want to build our many channel count system. People require 128 channel or 256 channel, even 1000 channel. So to build a many channel count system, we want that pre-seed fund. Uh, isn't is it similar to that uh, acoustic cluster therapy that is already getting into the clinical stage? Is your technology similar to that acoustic cluster therapy? This is not imaging. This is uh, ultrasound therapy. It's focused ultrasound, and uh, there are few FDA approvals right now there. But the point is, these phased arrays which focus the energy, they are very costly, and they usually suffer from low performance of these output triset output pulses. So this is therapy curing with sounds. It's not ultrasound imaging or laser therapy, as you said.